So we're now recording. So welcome to the UNCG Libraries Research and Application Webinar on Funding Open Access Publishing, Support from the UNCG University Libraries by Anna Kraft, the UNCG Libraries Metadata Coordinator. Uh, so Anna, you can take it away. All right, thanks, Sam. Uh, thanks everybody for being here. I'm actually gonna turn off my video uh, for the presentation just to keep things from um, lagging. Uh, in case there's any delay, but um, so welcome. Thanks for being here. Thanks to Sam for running the series and for facilitating and moderating today. And we're gonna be talking about funding open access publishing and how we can support that. So this is me, I'm the coordinator of metadata services here in the UNCG University Libraries. And um, here's what we're doing today. We'll have a really quick refresher on open access publishing. And then we'll talk about read publish deals and what those are and how they can help fund your open access publishing. We'll talk about the open access publishing fund, which I think some of y'all are familiar with, and we will also have time for questions. And as Sam said, um, you are welcome to enter questions in the chat as uh, we're going through the presentation. And if there's a good stopping point, we can uh, certainly stop and take those. And I know there's a lot going on right now. We've all got a lot on our minds. Um, so if you only take away one thing from this session, remember that if you, your students, your colleagues have questions about funding open access publishing, you can get in touch with me. So a quick refresher or quick introduction on open access. I know many of y'all are very familiar with this. But these are research outputs that are distributed online and they're free of cost or other barriers. So this is scholarship, it could be articles, it could be presentation slides, book chapters, full books, other things, and they're made available on the internet and there's no paywall, no login, anyone who has an internet connection can access those scholarly materials. And this is important because it really helps accelerate discovery of materials because they are so widely available. It enriches the public by making scholarship available to everyone, and it can help improve education, again, by making research and scholarship widely available to anyone who needs it. But what, what else can open access do for us? So in addition to all the things we just talked about on the previous slide, there are quite a few studies that show that articles that are made available through open access tend to have higher citation counts than those that are published through toll or subscription access. And this is so commonly shown in the literature that it actually has a name now, which is the open access citation advantage. And this really can vary across disciplines and according to other variables, but um, what, what is static is that there is an advantage. We just don't know exactly how much of an advantage. So these are some recent studies and all of these are linked in the slide notes. So if you're following along on, on the slides, you'll be able to go to the uh, articles that reference these. But recent studies have shown uh, open access citation advantage values from 8% to 40%. That's a huge variation, obviously. Um, but even if it's only as low as eight or 10%, that's still a big advantage in terms of citations. So this is worth thinking about if you're looking to increase the number of citations on your papers. Now, switching gears a little bit, um, does anybody know what the primary difference is between open access scholarship and traditional scholarship, which is also subscription-based or toll-based scholarship. Any thoughts on this? Sam says money, yes, very good. Um, so have any of y'all seen a, one of these before? I bet if you have done research, you have probably run into one of these. So yes, this is a paywall. Um, and here I was trying to access an article that 
we don't subscribe to through the libraries. And Taylor and Francis is letting me know that I could purchase this article for $51, or I could buy the whole issue for about $200. And maybe as a researcher, I have $51 that I could spend on this, but maybe I don't. And what if I am not sure that this is the article that I need? It sounds promising based on the title and the abstract, but I'm not really sure if this is actually going to help my research. And what if it's only one of 10 or 30 or 50 articles that I want to look at? I probably don't have $51 to spend on 100 articles. So this can, these paywalls uh, can really be a problem for people who are trying to access research. And the primary difference, which this is leading us to, is that the bills are not paid by readers in open access scholarship. And so they don't function as access barriers. I wanna be clear that there is still money involved. There are still costs associated with open access scholarship with the whole process of publishing and making it available, but it isn't the readers who are paying it. So the readers can access that scholarship without running into those paywalls. So it's free for readers to access, but it's not free to produce or publish just like any other type of scholarship. And one of the ways that open access scholarship is funded in some cases is through what's called article processing charges or APCs. And these are payments that are coming from the author or someone on their side of the process at their institution or their grant funder, um, the payment of a processing fee to the publisher. And this is a really common practice in what's called hybrid and fully open access journals. So hybrid journals are where you have a traditional journal that takes subscriptions, and that's generally how they fund themselves. But authors can select to pay an APC to make just their article available openly. So while the rest of the content in that journal would be available to subscribers, that one article or however many articles that had been paid through an APC would be open to anyone. And sometimes these APCs are paid through the author's funding agency, through a grant, or by their employer, but definitely not always. So APCs generate income for the journal or the publisher to cover costs that might otherwise be covered through subscriptions or advertising. And these costs might be things like paying the staff of the journal or the publisher, or paying for the online system that manages submission through publication of those manuscripts. Um, there may be other costs for journals as well. Um, and sometimes these APCs can be funded through financial awards and credits. We'll be talking more about this in a minute. In rare situations, journals and publishers may be willing to waive APCs for researchers who are in underfunded areas, generally based on geographic location. So this is not something that I would encourage most people who are here in the United States to be pursuing in terms of getting a, a hardship waiver based on geographic location but there may be cases where it's appropriate for some researchers based on a hardship situation. And it's always worth asking if you are in such a situation and you're trying to negotiate with a publisher. So APCs can really vary across publishers. There are some open access publishers that don't charge them at all, and they fund their their journals and their work through other ways. There are some open access journals based here at UNCG, where we don't charge APCs and the journals are basically funded through people uh, doing the work of the journal as part of their professional service. So nobody's getting paid um, and nobody's being charged APCs in order to make that scholarship available. Some APCs can be relatively cheap, a couple hundred dollars. This is sadly pretty uncommon. There are some APCs that I have seen that are as high as $6,000, which is also mercifully uncommon. Um, until about yesterday, $6,000 was the highest APC that I had seen um, referenced in the literature. But uh, one of our colleagues, Alyssa, who's on the call, is, let me know that there is a new um, 
A new initiative from Springer Nature, which is charging APCs of about $11,400, which is so much money. I mean, this is really high and it's very new, just started in 2021. And it's unclear how this, that's gonna shake out in terms of usage, but it really seems like it is pricing. I mean, $6,000 is already extremely high. So even, I mean, double that, I can't imagine most researchers having that kind of money to spend on an APC. Um, so that will be interesting to watch, but the average for what I have seen and that it's reflected in the literature for APCs is about $2,100 to $2,700. $3,000 seems to be a common amount, but sadly, like most things, um, these prices appear to be rising faster than inflation. And I also want to note that publishers and journals should be very transparent about what they are charging when they charge APCs. And you want to look for that information before you submit your manuscript. And if a journal is not clear with you about their on their website about what they charge, reach out to them. Um, if they won't tell you what their APC is, you may not want to send your work to that journal. That's really a big red flag. And if you have questions about if a journal's policies are ethical or if they are behaving in an ethical or unethical manner, librarians can help evaluate journal quality. Um, so your liaison librarian is a great place to start. And that link is available here in the slides. And you can also contact me. I, I also help people with evaluating journal quality. So, um, Anna, just before yes. you, went, um, Alyssa asked a question, um, technical question, does our catalog discovery layer retrieve access to open access articles in a hybrid journal to which we don't have access? What a good question. I'm actually not sure. Um, that would be something to look into. I, yeah, I, I can't answer that right now, but that's definitely something that would be interesting to follow up on. So thank you for the question. All right, so I'm a researcher. I want to publish open access, but I don't have a grant funder. My department doesn't have funding. So what can I do? How can I potentially fund um, making my scholarship available openly? The libraries are here to help. And so now we're gonna get into talking about these read publish deals and what this means and how it can help you. So these are new and developing publication models. They're sometimes called transformative deals. And the way this works is that the libraries are paying for content from these publishers, just like we have done for decades. So this is content that we read. Um, and because we are paying to read this content, these publishers are incentivizing for our researchers to publish with them. So this is the new piece. The read model has been there forever. We have been subscribing to journals for a long time, but now these journals are trying to work with us to, um, you know, everybody's having a hard time with budgets. So this is a way that they are trying to make themselves more valuable to us in terms of potentially keeping those subscriptions. So this published piece is new and we'll talk more about how this shakes out for us and what it can offer. So because we're paying to read that content, since we're subscribing, that content is generally not open access. So that's still, you know, the common thing that we've done for a long time. But the published aspect of these deals focuses on open access. So the deals support open access, meaning they benefit our researchers here at UNCG, but also they benefit scholars everywhere by making our authors content available to anyone. So a few questions. Are we telling people where they should publish? No, um, this has no impact on academic freedom. You are still completely able to decide what the best venue for you and your scholarship is. Um, all this is doing is providing some incentives to choose certain publishers, but no one is under any obligation to, uh, to do that. 
And where do these come from? So some of these are coming from libraries uh, consortia. We're in UNCG leads the Carolina Consortium, which is a leader in negotiating these deals. And some are UNCG specific, also negotiated through our libraries. And is this worth it? So these are very new. And UNCG is one of the leaders in uh, academic libraries in testing out these deals. So both publishers and libraries are still trying to figure out who these models benefit, if they benefit libraries more, if they benefit publishers more, if they benefit the users more, and if they're worth it for all of us. So we don't have a lot of experience so far. Um, a lot of these deals have been short term over a limited time or on a small scale. So we don't have a lot of data yet to inform our future decisions, but we are hoping with some of these new deals that we're gonna be talking about in a moment, we're gonna get more, uh, more use and more potential impact. So now we're gonna get into some of the specific options that we have. These are the four deals that we have to offer right now. Cambridge University Press, SAGE, IGI Global, and MDPI. And Cambridge University Press is the one that we are the most excited about. So with this, all articles published through Cambridge University Press journals that have a primary or corresponding author at UNCG will be eligible for open access publishing without an APC. So anybody at UNCG can take advantage of this. And this is the most potentially useful and impactful deal that we have got. It's brand new. It just started January 1st. And there are no vouchers, <clears throat> excuse me, no APCs, no limits. Anyone who has a UNCG email address is um, able to use this deal. So this is really ideal for people who want to publish openly, but don't have funding for APCs. And there's a link uh, in the notes and on the slide to the Cambridge University Press journals that you might wanna consider if you wanna take advantage of this deal. There is a small list of non-online journals that Cambridge has excluded from this deal. Um, but they are trying to move more of those journals online in this academic year. So that list is shrinking. And if you want to be sure that your journal is not on that list, let me know. It's not something that I wanted to share um, the whole list with when I was making the slides because the list is changing over the course of the year. But definitely follow up if you have a question about that. So Cambridge has almost 400 peer reviewed academic journals that are in subjects across a wide variety of areas. And this is the link to those journals. Um, so check it out, see if any of those are in your subject area and if they are potentially uh, interesting to you. How will this work? So they have an online system for manuscript submission that should recognize that your email address ends in uncg.edu. And again, it's important that you are the primary or corresponding author when you are submitting that manuscript and that you're using your UNCG email address. So the system should then give you the option to select free open access publication of that article. Has anyone tried this yet? Not that we know of. So this is very new. As I said, January 1st was the start date and people don't have to come through the library to get this deal. So we won't necessarily know immediately. Um, we do hope to be able to get this kind of data from Cambridge as the year goes on, but people don't have to tell us that they're doing this when they take advantage of this deal. So we won't automatically be told immediately. Um, and will it be as easy as it sounds? I really hope so. Um, but if y'all or your colleagues are trying this out and having um, good experiences, bad experiences, indifferent experiences, let us know. We would like to know how this is going. Our next publisher is Sage, and they offer a 10% APC discount for all UNCG authors who are publishing in their Sage Pure Gold open access journals. And that long title just means these are the journals that publish fully open access work. So these are not hybrid journals. They're not toll access journals. 
These are fully online or gold OA journals. And the link to that list of journals is available on this slide. And so they have, I didn't, they didn't provide a, a full uh, number. So I estimated based on their uh, looking at their list. I think it's, it's probably close to 200 fully open access journals. They published primarily in the social and behavioral sciences, but there are some, there's some, com some coverage in other areas. And the link to those journals, that list is on this slide. How does this work? So after your article is accepted, this is the email address that you want to contact. And um, you wanna include all the information here, article ID, and so on, and that you are eligible for the Carolina Consortium 10% discount. And this is uh, the, the deal-making or negotiation group that UNCG leads where a number of these republished deals are coming from. Again, we aren't aware of anybody having used this yet, but again, authors don't have to contact the libraries in order to get the discount. And sadly, a lot of SAGE journals that I have seen, their APCs are around three grand. So 10% is something, but it's not a lot. But there may be a way that you can get this knocked down even further. We'll talk about that more in a moment. IGI Global is our next publisher. We have a limited number of credits for APCs um, for publishing open access articles and book chapters with them. So if you are considering publishing an OA article or book chapter in an edited book, let us know. Um, these credits actually expire and we want to use them before they do. So if you or one of your students or colleagues has uh, an IGI publication coming up, get in touch with me. We would like to use these credits up. These are some of the areas where they publish. Um, so a lot of business, education, libraries. Um, oops. And we actually have had somebody use one of these and it was pretty easy. Um, so yeah, it, and this is a deal where if we actually if we buy more content from IGI, we will get more credits. So this is based on this deal is based on how much we spend with them. All right, so our next publisher is MDPI. And like the SAGE deal, this offers a 10% discount on APCs and BPCs, book processing charges, with the MDPI publisher. You wanna ask for this discount at the time you're submitting your manuscript. These are the areas where they publish. Kind of like IGI, they've got a, a variety of areas here. And this is not technically truly a read published deal because MD, MDPI is a fully online, fully open access publisher. So we actually aren't paying them to read anything. Um, they have a program that institutions can opt into that allows uh, people at that institution to get this discount. And I do wanna say that like all publishers, MDPI has journals that are really sort of uh, reputable and prestigious and some that are newer and perhaps uh, more in a gray area. So definitely consider the journal carefully before you submit your work. And you wanna do that with all open access journals. If you're trying to figure out if one of these publishers or journals is right for you, um, I would recommend that you start with your library liaisons. They are subject experts and they can help you evaluate um, finding out if one of these publishers has a journal or journals that may be really good for your work. If you need a refresher about anything that we have discussed today, um, this is all on our LibGuide. So all of these deals, and as we potentially add more deals, they will also be available on this LibGuide. And now really quickly, I wanna talk about the Open Access Publishing Fund and how that works into all of this. So some of y'all may have used this before. The libraries offer awards of up to $1,000 to offset the cost of publishing in open access journals and all full-time faculty, full-time EHRA employees and enrolled graduate students can take advantage of this fund. 
There's an online application form linked here, and it's also available on our LibGuide. And to my knowledge, there is still money available in this fund for the 2020-2021 academic year. This is a fund that we um, have had for a number of years, and it's something that we, it, we do fund it annually, and it does sometimes run out of money within a calendar year. Um, so it is possible that we will run out of money before this academic year ends. So if you are considering putting in a request, I would encourage you to do that as soon as possible. Um, if you need help evaluating a journal, if you're considering an open access journal, uh, I did a presentation for this webinar series in the fall about evaluating journal quality and avoiding predatory journals. Those slides are linked here and the link to the guide is also available on uh, this slide. So now combining these two things. You can technically combine funding from the OAPF and read publish discounts. So the OA Publishing Fund can fund up to $1,000 per accepted article, but as we know, many APCs cost more than $1,000. So for example, say you're publishing with Sage and say your APC is $3,000. You can apply to the OA Publishing Fund for $1,000 and if you're approved, you would have that money towards that $3,000 APC and you would still be able to use the 10% discount from SAGE and it would be 10% off of that full $3,000, not 10% off of the $2,000 after the money from the OA Publishing Fund. So SAGE isn't involved in the OA Publishing Fund. They don't need to know about where that money is coming from. Um, they just care that they get their $3,000. Has anyone tried this yet? Not that we know of. But this is something that is available to you if you are interested. And we definitely want to encourage you to spread the word about this among your colleagues, grad students, and others. And if you use any of these deals, we would love to hear about your experiences. If things are working, if they're not working, if there are publishers that you think we should be working with, um, we can't, we certainly can't guarantee that that's an option, but we'd, it's something that we could potentially ask about. And we want to be able to inform our decisions about continuing or changing these deals in the future. And if you need help with any of this, all departments have a liaison librarian. They provide subject expertise and can work closely with you in a number of areas, including potentially finding journals that would be appropriate for you to send your manuscripts to. I'm the main contact for people who have questions about open access and open access publishing support and funding. And Christine, who I believe is actually on this call, um, she leads the team that reviews applications to the OA Publishing Fund, and she manages logistics of actually transferring funds when people get those awards. So if you have questions about those logistics, she is the person to talk to for that. And I think I have almost kept this under 30 minutes, um, but if you have questions now or later, I would be glad to answer them. So thanks y'all for being here. Thank you. Um, so most of the question comments have just been comments of like, yes, uh, that's right. Or yes, that's a, a, a good idea. Um, now you're getting thanks. Um, and I did try to drop the like most relevant um, links throughout the chat. Um, sorry if I missed any. Um, so Joel was asking, how do we get the PowerPoint? Um, I'm going to send the link again. Um, if you click on this link, Joel, um, it will take you to the um, slides. Um, and the, um, also, uh, I will send the slide with uh, the recording. Uh, the uh, Zoom has been um, uh, pretty fast. So the big thing we usually have to wait for is I like to send out the transcript of this um, with it as well. And again, Zoom has been pretty good about uh, getting that all going. So are there any questions about open access funding? Um, I appreciate this. I always learn something uh, from going to these. Um, and uh, remember that Anna did note, um, as people are maybe thinking of questions about their uh, liaisons, be sure to contact your library liaison. And if you don't know who yours is, um, I'm happy to tell you. Uh, I think I have them all memorized. Um, so we'll see though, you can try to test me. 
So I'm pulling up in a quick assessment real fast. Sorry, I didn't do that earlier. Um, and if y'all have time before you leave, um, please fill out this quick assessment to let us know how you think this went. And uh, so um, Alyssa did ask a question. Um, so, and sorry, Joel asked, are lecturers on the list? Um, so it just depends on your liaison, but yeah, like I try to find the lecturers in my departments and email y'all about stuff and lecturers are welcome to come to these. And also you're well, you're, you get access to all of these funds that Anna mentioned. Um, so, uh, including, um, I think Anna mentioned this, but grad students too, if you're working with grad students who get published, um, again, most of them, including the open access fund that the library supports, you just have to have an at UNCG dot edu email address um and so then uh, melissa asked i have a question about another detail in the nature changes but i don't want to go uh it's too far afield i mean questions are welcome yeah please uh please ask Alyssa. okay um so th there were several changes uh i guess nature just didn't have an open access policy before this um so when I was looking at the information, it sounds like um, they have a, a deal where people can pay a significant amount of money, like two or $3,000 um, to have their article get like special editing feedback you're nodding <laughs> yeah I, I saw I, that in there that I I have well and then like the the like the idea is that you get kind of a deal on the APC assuming that your like article is eventually published I what do we I didn't like that idea at all what do you what are you yeah so so um this is in, this is referenced in the, um, let me see if I can go back to, um, it's on the APC slide where we talk about how much APCs are. Okay, so there's a link in the notes on this slide um, to an article about the changes at Springer Nature. And one of these changes, in addition to the new APCs that are like $11,400, it sounds like they are piloting a new um, service where you can send your manuscript and pay two or $3,000 and some editors will give it uh, more of a, they will look over it and recommend journals for you and maybe give you feedback about how to improve your article to potentially get accepted into those other journals. And I may not be fully remembering all the details, but it sounds like, I, I mean, paying an extra fee to maybe get accepted and you also might not get accepted. So paying two or $3,000 to get some feedback that might or might not get you then accepted where you could pay more money to publish. So I have not heard of journals, or at least not reputable journals, <laughs> doing something like that before. So I don't know. Um, no one has yet come to me and said, I'm thinking about doing this. And I don't know what I would do if they said that they were, um, other than feel very concerned. Um, I was, yeah, I was just wondering if that was a, a thing. A th well, uh, I mean, Oh, <laughs> um, this, this whole movement and, and what I said earlier about we're trying to figure out both publishers and libraries with these transformative republished deals, everybody's trying to figure out how we can make things um, sustainable for everyone so that scholars can keep publishing their work and make it available and get cited and get tenure and all of that. And publishers can still stay afloat and readers can still get scholarship but some of these publishers want to make a lot of money like they've been doing in the past, um, you know, money beyond what is paying for their staff and paying for their online systems. So um, 
it's a, a time I think of a lot of upheaval in a lot of these areas and a lot of these things may continue to change kind of quickly with certain deals that we have or practices of publishers. If nature or Springer Nature gets a lot of pushback about or doesn't get people taking advantage of those services, they may not continue them. But if they have a lot of people who are willing to pay two or $3,000 to get some feedback, they, uh, that may become more of a popular practice, not just with them, but with other publishers, which would be alarming, in my opinion, in terms of pricing scholars out of academic publishing in some areas who don't uh, have money to pay for those extra services. Yeah, I find like Alyssa um, said in the chat, it concerned me because it's definitely seemed like it would advantage scholars that are already well funded. And I think it brings up a lot of issue, the issue too, that I think we talked about in the last webinar, um, we did about this of like, you know, graduate students, newer faculty, um, and also like, I don't think we talked about this before, but like community college faculty uh, as well, who don't typically have access to any kind of funds um, through their library or anything like that. So, wah, wah, on a sad note. Um, yeah, yeah. Uh, so, but we we want y'all to we want to help y'all get funding for these uh, for getting your scholarship out there. And I didn't talk about NC Docs today, but if anyone wants to consider green open access routes where you you publish, you know where you publish, and then we uh, post those articles on NC Docs if copyright allows. Um, please get in touch. We would be glad to talk to you about that. My colleague, Alyssa, who just asked that question is one of our great NC Docs team members. And she may have worked with some of y'all uh, already about adding articles to NC Docs. Um, so that's another option that people have. If you can't pay to publish open access, there are other ways to make your scholarship available openly after the fact. I dropped a link to NC Docs in there. So if you all haven't um, looked at NC Docs, definitely do and uh, definitely take advantage. It's NC Docs at uncg.edu, right? As the email address. Uh, no, although no. The, there's a Go yeah. link. I think the Go link is go.uncg.edu. No, I meant like the email, if they wanted to email. Oh yeah, yeah. The email address is NC Docs uh, at uncg.edu. Yes. Sorry. Okay. Yes. There you go. Um, okay, well, um, are there any other questions or concerns? Um, or, I mean, I guess there's always concerns. But so many concerns. <laughs> you, well, we can continue talking about it. But um, are there any other questions for Anna before we um, end this? And again, remember I put a survey in there. Um, uh, I'll drop it one more time um, just to let us know how we did um, as well. So, um, Copy and paste isn't linking, uh, but uh, so the next one we have coming up, I see people are leaving, so I wasn't fast enough. There you go, is, uh, let me look it up. Got so many tabs open. I don't know if anyone else does that. So um, the next one we have coming up is on February 9th at 3 p.m. on ICPSR Student Data Sand Sandbox by Joe Klein, our data visualization librarian. So um, ICPSR's new Student Data Sandbox is an open repository for data used or generated by students and explore ways it can be used to teach research data methods, both as a source of data and as a tool for practicing data management and sharing. And then Anna has one coming up on March on quality journals. So thinking through where you wanna publish. And then we have one in April on Dimensions AI by our science liaison librarian, um, which is a new academic search engine that is shaping up to be a challenger to citation index like Scopus and Web of Science. And then um, in late April, we have an introduction to legal research by our social sciences librarian, Rachel Olson. Um, and that is, I feel like, pretty self-explanatory. So uh, keep that in mind. You can sign up. And even if you can't go to the live dates, um, we will send you a recording even if you can't come live. So sign up even if it's a topic that, uh, if it's the time you can't come. So thank you all for coming. Thank you again, Anna. And uh, everyone have a great week. So thanks, Thank you, Sam. And thanks, everybody, for being here. Thanks for your questions. And if you have more questions in the future, or if you'd like this uh, content presented at a department meeting or something like that, definitely get in touch. Thanks again. Thanks. Have a good week, everyone.